excess compared to the sum uh, of uh, uh, so-called refractory elements, that is, elements that easily condense. So here is a condensation temperature, um, uh, and you find that aluminium, for instance, condensed rapidly to some dust, uh, and so do these other elements, while the volatile so-called uh, CNO elements condense at uh, quite low temperatures. And there is this systematic uh, difference between the sun and the twins uh, in the respect that the sun is more relatively rich in volatiles than in refractories. And this is a small effect. Uh, it wasn't easy to prove it to be right. It's on this order of magnitude, well, 20%. It's significant, but not much more. Um, and we find this uh, not only for these 11 solar twins now, we have several uh, much huger samples and we can also compare with stars that are so exactly so alike and we find the same effect still. Um, and the question is, what does it tell us? Uh, one could, one could uh, phrase it like this. There are certain very odd stars, and the booted stars, that are highly depleted in refractory elements. The sun is a very mild lambda Bootis star. What has happened to the, in the history of the sun which made it depleted in dust form elements? It's the question. And of course, the whole thing was accentuated by this simple calculation that you take the present sun and you take the terrestrial planets and you dump them onto the present sun and mix them into the few percent mass that is contained in the solar convection zone. If you do this thought experiment, you will recover the twins. Because these contain more of the easily condensed. So, does this tell anything about? the existence of terrestrial like planets? If so, since most or almost all the twins we see have this other pattern, deviating from this, one would conclude that maybe terrestrial planets are rare. So that would make us and also journalists uh, thrilled about this. And as I said, there are independent studies now. First of all, these guys tried to show similar things but didn't succeed uh, and it's a question of beating down the errors in the analyses. Uh, we did it and uh, later on uh, almost independently Ramiro Sital did it with another material and now there was a studies of individual uh, solar twin like stars that proved this. So I think we can regard it as quite well established now. So it's not due to random errors. It's not due to model errors. And this is a daring statement because the effect is so small. 20% uh, in abundance analysis. I mean, all of us know that uh, the solar C and O abundances, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, at least oxygen, are uncertain by at least 0.1 x, at least 25%. How can we say that this is significant? Well, we do it in a very different way we select stars that are very similar to the sun and so the analysis gets independent, we hope, on model errors. Otherwise, the whole business of band analysis of stellar solution spectrum is dominated by the model errors, the errors in modeling stellar atmospheres. But could there be any problem with the asteroid which we picked in order to mimic the sun? The problem is that the sun shines in daytime and it's very bright, the stars in nighttime, and you need different equipment to do this properly. You can't observe the sun with a big telescope, uh, at least not a stellar telescope. Uh, and you should do it uh, in the same night, as close as possible in time and in the elevation above the horizon. Uh, and so we used asteroids to reflect the solar light and observe. And then we have several problems. Is the reflectance of asteroids really proper here? Maybe there are spectral lines that is probably not of any significance, at least not atomic lines. 
But could it be that we observe the asteroids and the sun in the equatorial plane? Why we see the stars at all sorts of axis rotations, uh, axis inclinations. So let's assume that the sun and all stars look differently. The flux spectrum could look differently when observed in the, in the ecliptic than if you observed from another location. Because of dust, you mean the ecliptic? Yeah. Or? No. Because, oh. because of the um, sun, solar. Oh, that is your dependent. Yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. And so one, one has to uh, look at this possibility, and we first thought we could do it with some asteroid at high altitudes, because there are such asteroids, but they are very faint. So we couldn't do that with a reasonable telescope. It's an interesting uh, thought experiment, thought experiment. The telescope you need is roughly a 40 meter. So one could imagine that the first project with an extremely large telescope, the next European one, would be to observe an asteroid. But I don't think we can get time for that. Uh, at which point uh, does model, I mean, uh, the model atmosphere uh, issue with 3D uh, atmospheres mm -hmm. relative to standard one day mm -hmm. at or zero D atmospheres, one day atmospheres come in? Is that what you count as under model errors? And how can you avoid, how can you, you can't avoid by differential analysis? By saying that given the fundamental parameters of the star, the uh, temperature, the metallicity, the surface gravity, we don't expect any considerable differences. Uh, if you may model it with 3D models and make small perturbations in these fundamental parameters, you find very small effects on the spectrum. So it has to be some other parameter. The question is what parameter would that be that distinguishes the sun from all the other stars? Mm -hmm. What about uh, the uh, distribution of spectral albedos for ast asteroids and how uniform are they? Yeah, they, they, they aren't very uniform, uh, etc. There are different sorts of surface uh, materials. <coughs> but they don't show narrow atomic lines. And we measure just the narrow atomic lines. We don't use any very broad uh, reflectance uh, spectrum characteristics. And so we set out in order to check this possibility of the sun looking differently in different, uh, at different latitudes uh, with a, a set of observations at the Swedish Solar Telescope and the new triple uh, spectrometer there. So I guess this was one of the first really tests in science projects for, for the triple. I don't know. Anyhow, it was. Uh, and we did this. Um, and the idea was then, of course, not to observe the total flux, but to look at, uh, carefully at the f uh, spectrum along the equator of the sun. We are sitting in this plane, wide on Earth, and along a meridian. And we picked essentially these points, which you see here. And then you say that, all right, how can you say anything about flux spectrum from these? Well, using a solar model, one can do it. And if there were any real variation with latitude, we would expect to see it in that point and that point, compared to this point and this point. Of course, there's a center to limb variation, so you expect the spectrum here not to be similar to there. But you don't expect that location with the same angular distance from the center to be very different from that. And in doing this, we were anxious to observe the same kind of spectral lines as were used in the stellar analyses I mentioned before. So we took a number of characteristic criteria from, fr from the previous work, which I referred to. So we have the volatiles, and we have refractories, and we have a number of spectral lines, which we then observed very carefully in observing around last year. And as I said, we used the new triple spectrometer there, which is a literal system, um, lens, essentially lens acting as a uh, collimator and a camera. Um, and it covers all this, or a very extensive spectral region at a resolution of 200,000, which is very good for stellar spectroscopy, but not very good for solar spectroscopy. 
not very characteristic even for solar high resolution spectroscopy, but it is fully sufficient here. Is that proper description? Well, the spectral the resolution is both good, but, but not extremely high. Yeah, that, that's one it, one it's one good, one. but it's not high. It's not too high. high. It's not too high. <laughs> <laughs> And here are um, some sort of results, so to speak. So you can see here uh, the spectrum added up along the slit at a number of times, start, uh, extending through 25 minutes. So all these are points are different exposures. And what is plotted here is data just for one spectral line, this aluminium line in the infrared, uh, where you see different characteristics for these lines, like line center position and full. Uh, um, full uh, width at half maximum on the spectral line, line symmetry, whatever equivalent width, which is of course important for the measuring of abundances. And you see variations here in percent. There are some variations, but they are small. And most of these variations, I suppose, are reflecting the fact that there are uh, variations in the uh, in the seeing conditions, and the slate is moving a bit. Uh, and that is granulation coming up. So is this already for one of the five spots um, in locations of the sun, or is it in the world? No, it's for one of the spots. Yes, okay. yeah. uh, I, I wanted to show this picture to give you an impression of the tremendous amount yes. of data we get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and if you look at another spot, you have a completely different time yeah. sequence. Yeah. Yeah. And summing this up, you can see get effects of this sort. This is one of the lines we use, it's calcium, one line. And you see four curves here at different colors uh, representing the northern location, up the southern location, the western and the eastern location. And of course, there's a move of the spectral line because the sun is rotating. But the question is whether the strengths are different. And here is the strength, or sooner, the variation of the strength variation of the strength um, in percent. So this is 1%, 2%, stronger line, 1, 2, uh, less strong line. Um, and uh, um, for the different elements, carbon, nitrogen, uh, sorry, sodium, calcium, carbon, oxygen, whatever, in spectral order, in wavelength order. And you see that there are small variations, if any. And you can then transfer these to abundances. So you can determine the abundances in the various locations and see whether you get different results of the sort we got for solar type twins. And here you see the effects, and this is indexed in the version of the abundance, differential abundance. And you see, uh, and zero is then the solar. And you see here that. Uh, there are very small deviations from the zero line. They are on the order of 1% or less for sulfur and much less for the other elements. And I talked before about effects of this magnitude. So we should have seen effects of this magnitude also if this is the explanation, if the latitude variation is the explanation. So, conclusion of special aspects on the sun is not the explanation. Um, there's another interesting fact, and that is that there's a caveat in, in the discussion here, and that is that the sun was observed at a abnormally extended solar minimum. And so the question is, is that typical? Maybe our stars, our twins, are sometimes active, as the sun is. And so shouldn't one bother about the activity variations in these spectral lines? And there are such uh, variations, probably, or, or even there are good arguments for them. There are there. And they may, may lead to greater effects. But using the other the literature studies of such variations, you can argue that most probably they are not very important compared to the effects we're talking about. So we safely feel we can also exclude activity as a reason for the various results. Uh, but there's still, I mean, what about the difference between integral light and um, and the center, light in the center? That is model dependent. Uh, I mean, I, when yeah. we transfer our results to integrated light, which we basically, in principle, do, 
to get this curve here, or this thing here. Uh, we we uh, um, we are depending on the atmosphere, but we can't conceive a reality which would deviate so much from the models that you would get an effect on the order of 0.08, uh, mm -hmm. because you did this only using models. You see. Mm -hmm. So solar composition is atypical for solar-like stars in the neighboring galactic field and so signs of dust at least. That's the conclusion. So now we come to the second half of the next part of the talk and that's the question why it's different. Then? And this is something which I have discussed uh, um, before at uh, Albanova I think almost eight months ago or something like that. But I will now do it again, and I'll do it in the light of what I know since last time. And now I have to be, be rather sketchy, and I will not repeat everything I said last time. I know that several of you were not there that time, and most of you probably don't remember what I said. So I'll try to, to give some hints backwards, but, but um, I want to also talk about the progress made since then. Um, there are three different possibilities now. And one is that the pre-solar nebula was different in chemical composition due to scattering yields from supernova or other, other um, stars like red giants that contribute to the uh, nuclear synthesis or the built up of chemical elements. And if the sun, for instance, would come from a different part of the galaxy than most solar twins do, I mean, some may have migrated outwards, for instance, in a galaxy. Maybe it was born some two kiloparsec inwards. If it was, uh, couldn't the chemical compositions be different there? Um, I can say directly that we have studied this rather extensively, and I'll give you some, we have some references here to that problem. And the conclusion is not. No. We can't conceive a mixed of supernova or red giant stars or whatever that led to this kind of effect. We don't believe that this difference in the chemical composition of sun is characteristic of any uh, uh, galactic uh, uh, cloud which existed some five giga years ago in within any reasonable distance in the galaxy. Um, the second possibility is that pre-solar nebula was different due to dust cleansing. That is, uh, in the cloud that the sun and maybe other stars were formed, uh, for some reason, dust had been cleansed. And how do you cleanse a cloud when stars are being formed? Well, if you form some very massive stars in the neighborhood, they may, by the way, depress, push out dust. For instance, that's one way of doing it, which actually probably is also occurring in it. And the third possibility then is that the protoplanetary nebula or disk was cleansed and its later accretion put imprints on the solar surface layers. This is a family of explanations, one of them which are hinted at by talking about the planets that were swallowed, maybe for other stars but not for the sun. And as I said, this first possibility, I think we can rule out. I won't discuss it here anymore. Uh, this primordial cleansing thing, there are some arguments which uh, I guess many of you are aware of that if you study uh, aluminium-26 isotopes and also other isotopes like this calcium, beryllium and iron-60 isotopes, uh, indicate or seem to indicate that there was an uh, uh, um, an interesting event uh, a few mega, m mega years only before the solar system was formed uh, some kind of supernova explosion created these uh, isotopes it's very hard to make these things without uh, taking a um, at least a supernova light uh, thing into action and also have it rather close in time 
to the very dimension of the solar system. So if there were a supernova, there were massive stars around, and if there were massive stars around, yeah, you could have this radiative cleansing of the becoming solar cloud. And then one could ask yourself, uh, are solar type abundances characteristic of stars from dense stellar environments? So let's go out and look at stars born, which we know are born in dense stellar environments, and see, are they solar? And having thought this thought, we went for the best one, which is this M67. Uh, it's a delightful uh, cluster. Um, it's one of the very richest. It's uh, of solar age and solar metal. It's one of the richest open clusters. And here we started looking for solar twins, and uh, this Italian group has actually looked for solar twins just to see if there were suitable ones. They haven't explored them very carefully, but we found this one which we headed at and observed. And uh, if you look at the current magnitude diagram, it's located here. Uh, and it's quite nice, quite similar to the sun, as you will see. Uh, the cluster is known to have an age in this interval, so the sun fits, and the metallicity is also solar. This is the usual way of, uh, of giving abundances in logarithmic uh, abundances relative to the sun, and if this quantity is zero, then it's solar. And um, spectra are good, not fantastic good, but signal to noise is satisfactory, remembering that we have to deal with a 15th magnitude star. And here are two spectra, we have, we have lots of spectra, but here is, is one short spectral region uh, containing magnesium B triplet lines, that you have two spectra plotted, over plotted, you have this star and you have the sun, and you see they fit very nicely, this is the difference. Between. So they are, it's really very similar. Mm. That's the asteroid sun? Sorry? That's the asteroid sun? Yeah. It's an asteroid, it's not the sun. Mm. And this is the, the, the result. Um, the, the line I showed you uh, initially, the Melendez et al. line for the solar twins, was this line here. <coughs> And here is carbon and oxygen. They used to be here, they are now here. And sulfur used to be there, it's now there. This is zero line. And here are the refractors. And this is a very clear signal. It's the most solar-like star we have seen. So it's kind of rather a story. As a story, it's rather nice to tell because we looked for 100,000 stars we picked in the galaxy. We picked out the 11 best ones. We explored them. All of them were more different from the sun than the first star we observed in this class. So, having reached this conclusion, we dare to ask another question. Is the sun from this cluster? Mm -hmm. It now contains about 2,000 stars. Uh, one can one has model this. It, it's rather high up above the galaxy plane. When it passes it, it interacts with, with the tidal forces of the galaxy, in particular with the giant molecular clouds. And so you can calculate that it has lost on the order of 80% of its stars. And the question is, so there used to be 30,000 stars or so. And the question is, was the sun one of these? Now, we have an interesting problem. The class is, as I said, high above the plane. Uh, it's about 410 parsec above, which is a lot. Uh, the, the thin disk, the old thin disk, which galactic disk, which uh, the sun belongs to, is on the order of 100 parsec, or a little bit more. But this is much more. And the sun itself never reaches higher above the plane than 80 parsec. So, if you think of this cluster coming in, you can say, okay, it has to lose stars, it, it 
known to lose stars, when it comes and if it happens to lose the sun when it comes to the plane, and if the sun happens to be scattered by tidal forces from giant molecular clouds or by, by stellar passages to be, to be placed in the plane, then all of it. But the chance for this isn't fantastic. And the very kind of situation, why do we sit in the plane? Gets worry. Uh, there's another possibility which I think is more reasonable and that is that the cluster was also born in the plane and it has evaporated stars, it has lost stars, sun is one of them, and then the cluster has interacted with a giant molecular cloud. I mean, typical clouds have a weight of one million solar masses, so this cluster is, is, is was also then considered lighter. So one could imagine a cluster being linked up to this orbit after it lost the sun. Well, I, I mean, this is an open cluster. Where are most of the clusters generally born? In globular clusters are more, I thought, always away in the halo, basically. Yes, they are. And, and they are the open ones. Uh, open clusters are, this is an extreme case, open clusters are usually in the plane. Yeah. But you could say also, maybe this was born at this orbit, it has a greater chances to survive in such an orbit than if it were in the plane. And so the corresponding clusters in the plane are probably <coughs> dead or, or, or are dispersed already, while this one is one of the few that are of this size. And size is also helping, of course. Gravity is stronger, keeps the stars there. So, so there may be a, a kind of selection conspiracy behind it. <coughs> okay, if you start speculating about this, you can say, ask questions like, did the cluster get out of the galactic plane after the sun left the cluster? That's what I did a minute ago. What could have happened to the solar system when the sun was in the cluster? Would it survive? It's relatively dense. We have lots of star passages. What's the chances for the solar system to survive? What would happen to the odd cloud, you know, the cloud around the solar system of cometary and asteroids, like whatever bodies that are it's quite a big thing. And uh, did that, how much sounds of astronomical units be? Did that survive a cluster environment? And finally, <coughs> there was this enigmatic late heavy bombardment early on in the history of our solar system when lots of imprints were made, craters on a number of planets and bodies, uh, like the moon. And, and these, these imprints are ascribed to a uh, a violent bombardment of asteroid-like things. Um, and what linked them in at this time? What made this bombardment occur? And is that possibly linked to the star passage which brought the sun out of the cluster? You, you can start speculating like this, and so did Sky and Telescope, by the way, when we mm -hmm. heard about this. Uh, and so we so thought maybe one can turn this into some science and we have Hans Wickman in Uppsala who is a dynamicist and interested in all cloud things and so we started this project and it's still unpublished um, we go to a conference with it soon but uh, it might be of interest to you what you see here is M divided by V M is mass of a passage mass of the star passing, passing the sun within 250 <coughs> AU, I think. And V is the uh, velocity of that. And the greater V, the smaller V is, and the greater M is, the more heavy imprint you get on the solar system. The greater the dynamic of the face will be. So M divided by V is the proper thing to calculate. And here is the frequency diagram for the present day environment, the galactic disk where we sit. So you see you have a number of, of, um, of uh, such events per a given time, but quite few. Why, this is what we would have had if we were in the M67, in the early days when there were 30,000 stars or so. And so you see that there was a very great flux of these events, and the question is, would we survive them? Would the solar system survive them? How long would the sun be there? And uh, this we have modeled. 
And the preliminary conclusion now is that typical residence time for a star like the Sun in a cluster like M67 is one giga year. And that fits well with on the order of 80% now, having lived, left it after four or five giga years. <coughs> it turns out, if you make these simulations, that planetary systems will survive. I mean, the chance for our solar system, or planetary system, to survive is, is on the order of 50% or so if we stay in this environment for one year a year. And also, the uh, thing which brings us out, which is then probably a stellar passage, a, a, a star in the cluster passing the sun and the sun getting out and the star getting closer to the cluster center as a result. Anyhow, such uh, events would also get would also be reasonable to survive for the solar system, but not for the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud is definitely destroyed by this. So, conclusion, we were not there, or Oort cloud wasn't there. Is it possible that Oort cloud has been formed later? And it turns out that there is, in, according to the simple NIST model for the solar system, uh, there's a very reasonable chance that the Oort cloud is created Late, more late by bodies uh, in, in uh, much closer orbits around Neptune so being scattered out gradually as time goes. So maybe we can't, uh, we can't say here, but it is a kind of interesting thought that the Great Bombardment marks not only a close passage of the Sun to another star, but also marks the event when the Sun left the cluster. Um, there's one point at least, a strong one against the dense Earth environment hypothesis, which I've been discussing now. And that is that observationally in star forming regions, there's not much support for the massive stars forming first and then the lighter ones. You know, we needed this massive star to get rid of the dust, push out the dust, and then forming the sun. But it seemed to go the other way. At least that's my impression. You have a number of star forming regions where the lighter stars have formed, but no dense stars have been visible yet. On the other hand, against that argument, you can say, oh, no, I said a minute ago that you need to produce these odd isotopes by a massive star in the neighborhood of the sun. So at least that was one that was before us in our immediate Conclusion here is we need to analyze more stars in M67. We need to see whether this is a unique star or in its context or whether all the stars there show the very solar-like properties in abundances that we have talked about. And so we, when I gave this talk last time, I had this slide up, you know, mm -hmm. and I promised this and said even, I remember it very well, mm -hmm. that I'll come back and tell you at this time of the year what we have. And this was Keck observations, and we had three nights, and we sent a good student <coughs> there, and the three nights were cloudy. Yeah. So we didn't get any observation. He sent back a picture of the full moon, which looked very faint. <laughs> and that was it. He got a very good solar spectrum from that. Um, but anyhow, uh, we have now gotten uh, time at uh, VLT, ESA VLT, and that is <coughs> fortunately service time. That means that, and it has high priority, so they will carry it out. If the telescope works, it will be done next spring. And we have four more solar light stars from that cluster. I bet they have different abundances from this creature. <laughs> and, and this is important because the other part of the project will come to now, exploring the other hypotheses. Wouldn't like that all these things are explained by just the fact that stars were formed in a common cluster. So we we'll see. So now we go to the solar pollution hypothesis. And with that I mean that <coughs> the sun is formed in a cloud, uh, but this solar surface has been polluted by some dust cleansing of the uh, cloud that is being accreted onto the sun. So it's more similar to this uh, 
uh, hypothesis that you have the disk, you form the terrestrial planet, something like that, and then you dump the gas, dust depleted gas, onto the sun. <coughs> and the problem here is to get a reasonable effect advocating these things on the solar atmospheric composition. And that is because the solar convection zone is quite, according to standard models, quite deep. Actually, when we're talking standard models, <laughs> the idea is, it go back to Hayashi, uh, the stars are, as you know, hydrostatically not in equilibrium, they can't be in equilibrium, uh, off to the, to the right of a specific line here called the Hayashi track. So, the, uh, and not until the stars have come in here, they get into hydrostatic equilibrium, and then they are fully convecting. And Hayashi conjectured then that, okay, it starts must form somewhere here at very low temperatures and low luminosity, and they go up here, they collapse, they are not in hydrostatic equilibrium. Where do they begin in the HR diagram? Of course they begin just where they start becoming hydrostatically stable. You see? This is a figure of thought that has been there since the 50s. And we print it still in lectures. You find it in all textbooks. Of course, stars come in here and have to be in hydrostatic equilibrium where they first can be in hydrostatic equilibrium. And this is, of course, not at all right. I mean, they can, why can't they move far in here, still in disequilibrium, until they finally settle in hydrostatic It's interesting because we have written several papers on these now, and we still get references locked up on the Hayashi idea that as soon as they have a chance to become hydrostatic, they become hydrostatic, even if from a dynamical point of view they aren't. So the question is, where is the stellar birth line? Where do the stars stop? And I think one reason why you see still these evolutionary tracks being preached and age determinations being made using these kind of evolutionary tracks. A reason for that is, is very simple. That is, we don't know how to begin a stellar contraction calculation. Uh, if it becomes very cumbersome, it's much simpler to just adopt the standard recipe, the Hirashua. The age would not be engaged correctly even for the sun, mm. perhaps, yeah. Now, well, you know, this ha these things happen in typically 10 to 7 years, while what happens yeah, yeah. here is, small. yeah, so, so it's a very small correction. But, but I wonder about age dimensions here. Mm. They are questionable. Okay. Uh, let's look at the ages. Uh, this is a recent set of tracks. Um, and you see here, you see, the ref no, it's not a recent, sorry. But in recent uh, sets can give very similar results. You see here, along the one solar mass track, it's this one, you see isochrones here, and this is then uh, the isochrone for um, this is. This is the isochrone for one million years. So the sun is still on the Hiatu track, it's fully convective here. Here it starts becoming non-convective. It's five million years. Here we are up to is that this isochrome? Ten to seven? Ten million years. And that's where finally it starts getting mainly radiated. So all this is the Hayashi track, this is the region where it's fully convective and all <coughs> fully convective, and finally here, the convection zone is only a few percent. This is the so-called Henley track coming later. So all the way here, you have a deep convection zone, and of course it's very expensive to, or very difficult to pollute such a huge mass. You should remember the protoplanetary disk is not thought to contain, at these stages, more than a few percent perhaps of the solar mass. And then if you do some fractionation in that, it won't affect the complete sun if the sun is being mixed totally. <coughs> so we have a timescale problem. Here you see the 
a fraction of the sum that is convective. That's this. And this curve then, here is the radiative fraction, and this is uh, the full solar mass, and here you see the 2% that are still convective at the surface, and then uh, plotted here is the time axis, and this is 10 mi million years, this is 20 million years, and not until, as I said, 30 million years, here roughly, um, the sun is convective only to 2% in the 2% upper level layers, and still is, that's roughly the figure today also. So 30 million years is a problem. Um, because this is a, a, a plot showing the estimated ages of observed protoplanetary disks. And you see that you have ages on the order of 1 million years, 10 million years, but not more than that. So they don't become 30 million years. And you need them to become 30 million years if you want to pollute the, di pollute the sun by dumping cleansed disk material onto it. Um, solar disk is unusually long-lived. Well, could be. You could even think of a replenishing of a solar disk. And people have suggested that to explain our observations. Maybe uh, there was something happening which replenished the solar disk and the planets formed and then the stuff was dumped when the solar convection zone was already here. <coughs> but another possibility is that this is wrong. This curve is wrong. And now I thought I would have, should have spent time in discussing more classical work on uh, spherical accretion at a continuous rate. Uh, I will do it very rapidly. I say that, first of all, we have this old idea of Hayashi, which I've already said is questionable. Um, the reasoning is, is not describing the way more detailed solar uh, uh, spherically symmetric continuous accretion models work. Because of key factors instead that did you tune in Burmese. Uh, and that's known since 20 years. If you introduce a deuterium burning, you get the following scenario. Uh, initially, you have a low mass hydrostatic core and then a big cloud around it, and the whole thing collapses non homologously and very much so. You get a, a gravitational energy release close to the core, and there you get a strong heating, of course, um, uh, increasing shock and get a heated core and you get a, a region almost empty of matter in between an opacity gap so photons escape from this core and in the core since it contracts and, and the temperature increases but when you reach a temperature of 1 million Kelvin uh, deuterium burning starts and deuterium burning has this great dependence on temperature so, it acts as an thermostat. Um, so, you get a, you force the star into hydrostatic equilibrium by releasing your deuterium energy. And the, the, the total energy you can release is not small. It's comparable. It's one order of magnitude less only than the gravitational energy released altogether here in the cloud. But that's a very low burning temperature, right? Yeah. It's, it's a lower by factor of 10 compared to hydrogen. It's preceded then by, by other, by hydrogen, of course, even. Yeah. Sorry? It will, it will not be superseded no. by hydrogen soon? Yeah, yeah, when, when it has finished. But yeah. as long as there is deuterium, it will be able to keep the, temp the yeah. star at the temperature of 1 million degrees, the star center at the temperature of 1 million degrees. That's very low. Yeah. But that's it. Uh -huh. yeah. One million. One million. Um, not one billion. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, not one billion. No, one billion. Uh -huh. um, and this, of course, uh, you release energy, you release uh, entropy, and you therefore get a flash of convection. And this convection 
occurs together with a steady state burning. The whole thing is in hydrostatic equilibrium. So one could say, let's go back to this old concept here of the starting line. Instead of adopting the Hayashi track as the starting line, the starting line is, it's much more reasonable to assume it to be where deuterium burning starts. Because that can force the star into hydrostatic equilibrium. At least if it is a continuous burning of deuterium. In a minute I'll discuss a non-continuous burning. It's interesting to see these old papers. There's a full series of Pala and Stalin on this, where they calculate the development of entropy here. You can see at a temperature of zero, when deuterium burning starts, the entropy distribution when at the start, this is a 1.5, so the mass star doesn't matter. Uh, you see, the entropy distribution is very even, and that's because convection has evened it out when convection starts. But then when time goes, here deuterium is finishing in the core, and so entropy starts lowering, specific entropy goes down. Still, this, uh, this negative entropy gradient, uh, sorry, yeah, positive in terms of relative well, AMR, uh, this, uh, this entropy gradient stops roughly here, so the convection is still taking most of the, this star or these models uh, envelope. Uh, uh, or mass after uh, 3 times 10 to 6 years. And it, it goes even slower for, for lower masses than 1.5 solar masses. Um, it's also interesting to look at what happens to the various energy releases. So here is a release of deuterium. That's a constant luminosity for a given model just because it is this thermostat. But then you see how the, the um, uh, radiative luminosity increases, and when it starts approaching the total accretion luminosity, then radiation is, of course, the only or major uh, energy transport mechanism. And the surface luminosity, these things happen in the star, and the surface luminosity starts rising very much here at this critical mass. And this leads to interesting phases and in the whole development. If you look at the mass radius relation, it shows interesting jumps. Sometimes it's what you expect it to be. Sometimes it rises very much when, when these different energy transport means change. Uh, it's worth reading these papers. They, I think they clarify this nicely. Okay. And I got interested in this, uh, and I needed a new tool because I wanted to calculate these kind of models. I've been, on Wednesdays, I've been trying to use my time, you know, in the second program and go to your interesting talks and lunches. <laughs> uh, uh, what I'm doing is I'm uh, taking up an old standard code in this where I add deuterium because it wasn't in, I add new molecular opacities, and I add uh, mass infall and try various secretion recipes and I must confess that after half a year of relatively hard work I've still not gotten a believable uh, results out for violent accretion. I need it for violent accretion but I can do slowly accreting things if you want such models. Um, and I, 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 part of this is a dynamical term. There's, you know, this term describing the luminosity, in, which then includes the entropy change. And the entropy change to calculate that for an accreting star is non-trivial. You have to use various tricks. But I don't have time to go into that. Uh, have I got five minutes more? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, these are some examples of my attempts. Uh, what I essentially verify what, what other groups have gotten for the classical accretion. Um, uh, for, for, uh, these are calculations for one solar mass, the red curves. And you see that uh, when this curve here with a constant entropy um, is, um, has been steepened enough to encompass most of the star, we have reached ages on the order of two times to seven years, which is, which is ages which I talked about before. So I, I think we, we, we can safely draw the conclusion that uh, a solar standard model 
is convected until, say, at least 20 million years. So here, is, here are these tracks again, but from a more modern set with a birth line plotted. And as you see, I can reproduce fairly well for a solar mass what people have gotten with this kind of, of smooth accretion and deuterium burning. And uh, if you look at the time here, this dip here occurs at 10 to 7 years. And this end point there is 30 million years, just as before. So, it seems we cannot meet the time constraint, a time constraint in terms of disk survival <coughs> until the convection zone is thin. We can't meet that with standard accretion, provided that disk does not remain for a longer time than believed. And so, there are other alternatives. One suggested early on is that maybe convection is different. It's time you can, we have to take, when people do this, you know, uh, they have essentially a time-independent convection recipe, a mixing length type of thing. Um, and uh, that we talk about rather short times, so maybe that's wrong. And also accretion takes place from a more or less clumpy medium outside and so maybe accretion takes place episodically and maybe also the, w the properties of the accretive material are not what you think. Uh, I mean the gas has been accelerated towards this shock front, it has lost lots of, of gravitational energy uh, so it becomes very hot when it reaches the shock. Is that hot material really dumped onto the star directly or is it free to radiate in a, in a disk for a long time before it suddenly ends up onto the star? Uh, you can say surface conditions couldn't play a role. They could. Uh, it's clear from, from the simulations here that the boundary conditions of, of uh, PMS models, of models in this stage, are quite determining for the inter internal structure compared to what you see for standard models which have a hydrogen source in the center. They are governed very much by what happens in the center. While here, not so much happens in the center, in particular when the deuterium burning is not there. So, so one has to worry also about that. The first one to come out with uh, untraditional solutions was Wuster, uh, together with Klesson and Scharnutter. And um, uh, as initial conditions, they had 3D simulations of, of the cloud collapse, and they said these things into a spherical symmetric model with time-dependent convection according to a particular recipe which I don't think I believe so much in. But anyhow, the net outcome was that instead of getting the stars when they finally had hydrostatic equilibrium onto this Hayashi track, this is part of the HR diagram, a small part here. You see this is a traditional giant branch or, or sorry, no, Hayashi track. Um, then they pushed the stars when they arrived in hydrostatic equilibrium onto a line which is 1,000 Kelvin hotter. And these models are not convective <coughs> all through. They have a convection zone which are on the order, is on the order of 10% of the mass. So that was the first indication, unfortunately in a rather badly written paper. But here is a very clear conclusion at least this deviation in the result of a, is of a qualitatively different stellar structure. Most notable, the solar mass stars resulting from collapse are not fully convective, as is assumed in the hydrostatic calculation. Instead, they do have a radiated core of similar relative size as the present sun. Convection is confined to a shell in the outer third of the stellar regions. And so that was interesting. And then came these uh, simulations by, by Vorobio von Basso and also by others, but Vorobio von Basso made very nice plots and films showing uh, how a uh, accretion disk um, creates lumps of stuff which later on fall into the stars. There are more, re more recent films of this sort, fantastic. Uh, I don't know if I believe them, but they, they show the present plan is to be the roughly 15th generation of planets. All our predecessors have fallen onto the star, the sun. That's beautiful. 
I, I don't know if this is it's true. But anyhow, when they fall in, uh, they um, create a, 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 a great race in luminosity. First of all, of course, because they release gravitational energy, but also they come in with deuterium. And this deuterium burns. And in fact, these are the predictions made. You see here the mass accretion rate, and this is uh, uh, considerably increased from this low level up to uh, on the order of here 1,000 of the solar mass per year. So these, the red, you see, look, should look at the red curves here, spike here. And here's the bolometric luminosity in thousands. This is 1,000, this is 2,000 solar luminosities. And this, you should follow the blue curve. And you see that you get these spikes. And these spikes remind of the FG Orionis objects, the prima sequence stars, Titori like stars that are known to do these things. Um, maybe all stars do it. They don't occur so often. Um, but anyhow, um, 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 that was a basic reason for Borobi of Ambassador to write this paper to point out this possibility of explaining that with new Orionis objects this way. And then came this paper last year by Barash and Sabri, where they, inspired by these results, they made models of accretion, models of accreting uh, pre sequence stars. And if you look at those results, this is radius, and this is time, and this is uh, one million years is there, logarithmic time, <gasps> and this is the standard accretion. No, sorry. Now, this is a standard solar model. Yeah. And this is a model starting with 0.1 solar masses and accreting episodically. And this is a model starting with only 30 Jupiter masses. And this is a model starting with 10 Jupiter masses. So this is on the order of one hundredth of the solar mass start. And you see that the radius is never greater than about one solar radius. But the temperature, already after 10,000 um, years, it is up to 10 to 7 degrees. It's up to the hydrogen burning almost, not too fully, it comes there here. And you see, the smaller the, the body is to begin with, the higher temperature it has soon. You can see all these steps corresponding to the lumps falling onto the star. And here you see the consequences on lithium burning. So this is a standard lithium burning where lithium is depleted by a factor of two or so. While these stars, being so hot, are burning their lithium very rapidly and efficiently, and very little lithium remains after a while. So, from the lithium abundance of the sun, we have a constraint on the possibility of this. And here, in particular, of interest to us, is the convection zone development. So, here is again the radiative zone relative to the total zone, and this is 30 million years, and you see a few percent there in the standard case. This is 10 million years, and about half is still convective uh, uh, on the star. While, if you start with a small thing and accrete episodically, you deplete the convection zone almost from the beginning, very, very early on. So the question was, could it be that? And Baraf and Chabria, they claim that this works the following way. Um, you have a small starting mass, or what helps this work is that you should have a small starting mass and radius, I mentioned that. You should have episodic character of accretion. You should, you should have a cool, low entropy matter accreted. And then they stress the significance of opacity dependence on temperature. When you reach these high temperatures above uh, one million degrees, the opacity goes down. And so radiation takes over. Um, so if you reach the high temperature, also that helps in depleting the significance of convection or depleting convection. And it's very clear <coughs> to read this paper that they don't understand it. And so, uh, what I was talking about, I use my camera. 
I'm sorry for that. But I thought to talk about how to understand it. And I have some ideas. Give me two minutes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it will depend on something for your sketch. Yeah, but that's more than one. Mm-hmm. It's more than two minutes. But I can say the following. If you begin with a small lump, so here it's a small lump, and you burn deuterium in the interior, so it's convective, okay? Then you can calculate the nuclear time scale of that. And that's the mass of it times the efficiency of mass converting to energy. That's essentially the human abundance and the uh, release of energy uh, from one gram of deuterium burning divided by the luminosity. And if you make simple estimates of these things, you find that for a one solar mass here, one solar mass, this is on the order of, this time scale is on the order of 10 to 6 years. And then you can look at the Kevin Helmholtz time scale of this. That tells you how the, the cooling of the star or the thermal reconstruction of the star will occur. That also a measure of how rapidly radiation will take over from convection in such a situation. Uh, it's the same order of magnitude. And that turns out for one certain mass. Um, so the Kelvin Kel- 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 is on the order of 10 to 7. I mean, uh, what M is in mass, uh, that doesn't dimension the That's the mass. It must be in the Hudson energy, and then you have what's that, something like adding 10. Natural energy, C equals to 1. No, no. <laughs> uh, the delta here is the energy release uh-huh, okay. per mass. I see, one. yeah, right, okay. But, so it's 1 million years for one star mass? The nuclear time scale? The deuterium mm-hmm. Oh, the deuterium is the only deuterium. So there's a deuterium abundance in here, which is 10 to minus 5. Sorry for being so sketchy. Okay, now if uh, you start with a much smaller mass, of course this time goes down. So if you start with 10 to minus 10 solar masses, for instance, which is one of these low things, you get a, so 0.01 masses, you get 10 to 4 years for this time. Um, and if you look at the Kelvin, Kel, corresponding Kelvin Helmholtz time scale for that small bit, and that is important here. Why? Because you are still so little that you won't get any other nuclear burning occurring. So the thing will cook. It will not be heated by other elements cooking. It won't reach those, uh, that heat in the center. So you, uh, the Kelvin Helmholtz time scale will kill you if you can't do anything new then. And that one is, for this smaller thing, is on the order of 10 to 3 to 10 to 4 years. So you have to do something before 10 to 3 to 10 to 4 years. If you have this body and want it to continue as a star. And what you can do then is, of course, to add stuff, stuff onto the surface by creep, by pulse. And this then, if you take, if you have a this kind of accretion. And you have an uh, interval between the two, delta. And then you can estimate the nuclear time scale for during this accretion episode. So here you put lots of stuff onto it and you mix it efficiently into the star if the star is still convective. That is, if, you, if the Kelvin Helmholtz time hasn't gone, you still can convect it into the, into the star and burn it, and then you, get, you have a nuclear time scale, which is, let's assume that you add 10 to minus 2 solar masses on. So you use essentially this one again, but you have uh, uh, 0.02 in, 0.01 in each of these, and then you get, you have a luminosity, which you have to also Estimate and typical observed luminosities, if you can relate to those, are on the order of 10 to 2 solar. 
one hundred cell and that's also what this cathode is all models give. So it's reasonable. And then you have uh, 10 to minus 2 cellular masses times this efficiency factor, which is the same, divided by 10 to 2 cellular luminosity. And this is on the order of 100 years. So, <coughs> trick is the following then. You have the core, and, and if you make it small, Um, if you make it too big, then uh, the whole thing goes on for a long time. But if you make it small, you can get a nuclear time scale which is quite low, on the order of 10,000 years. And the whole thing will die out if you don't do anything within that time after. So you first add this stuff, first have this core. And then before that time you have to do something. But if you then add on the order of 10 to minus 2, that will burn intensively during 100 years. And after that you can calculate it, uh, this time scale again. So if you within that time scale add another such pulse, you can keep the star shining in, in the pulses with the velocity on the order of 10 to 2 and otherwise on the order of one. So, so, so that is the suggested trick. And you need then on the order of 100 such pulses to do it. And if you do it this way, the temperature will be kept up and it will increase for every time you add more stuff on the surface. So qualitatively, I think it's not so difficult to understand what is happening here. They have designed this scheme to get it. They kick. They have a small core to begin with. That helps them. And they get, get it up and the convection dies out in it. But before everything cools, they kick it again. And they heat it. They, it starts cooling again. And they kick it again. It starts cooling a little. But they kick it before. And by designing these parameters right, they reach this high temperature. Opacity goes down, radiation takes over. The whole thing is, is there. And it happens in 10 to 4 years. So we have a star with a thin convection zone on the surface after quite a small. That seems to be the trick. Uh, it's not clear. Uh, and uh, that's why I want to, uh, to uh, reproduce this, because I, I'm not sure. They don't understand it, I think. And uh, as you see, this is the level of my own primitive understanding. Um, episodic accretion with great accretion rate in each episode burns D intensively. Nuclear burning time for each episode is short. Radiative core is established early on. Time between episodes is shorter than Kelvin Hedman Hoff's time scale in early phases in order for the object to survive uh, hot. And contraction can continue in this de uh, deuterium free core and leads to heating in the, in the end, of course, uh, hydrogen ignites. There are other papers. This one by Japanese group, they wanted in particular to discuss the scattering in the HR diagram of these uh, clusters. Uh, I won't go into that, but they tried different recipes with, with uh, accretion scenarios. Here's, here's one of them and another one. And they studied what happened in the interior of these models. And they got the following end points in the HR diagram. I can't go through this picture. It looks very these are evolutionary tracks, but these are the end points where the stars get hydrostatic in hydrostatic equilibrium finally. And they find that these end points are not very important in, in depending on the Christian history. So they don't support the Baraf Chabri main conclusion that the Christian history matters a lot. But on the other hand, they found very different evolutionary tracks depending on the initial radius and initial mass of the object. So, so this, I'm not talking about any mass. I'm talking, all this is one cell mass. I'm talking about 
to start with a very small thing or a rather big thing when these uh, episodes start. Depending on that, you get very different locations here. So that's why I think, I mean, the, the study of clusters here and the scattering of these cluster and color magnitude diagrams is, is a very important thing. Finally, there's an interesting, a very nice paper, I can recommend it, but uh, Lee Hartmann and, Hartmann and his collaborators, they explore the spectrum F in Orionis, and they succeed in modeling that with a model which is not too, too much fitted uh, to the observations. Here is the model in, in black and the observations in red. This is the ultraviolet part which also fits. And that's the important part, because this strong ultraviolet flux supports the idea that this model, which is a model of an accretion disk and a star uh, uh, 2D hydrodynamic model. Here you see the accretion disk, and this is an angle, uh, latitude angle for the disk, and this is uh, distance, so it's one astronomical unit, but the point they stress here is the color or the temperature. You see, you have the interior part of the accretion disk is on the order of 100,000 Kelvin. And that explains the UV flux. So they don't get that. They don't get this fit here with a much cooler model. And this makes them think that, <coughs> okay, accreted matter in these episodes, because this is, this is a study of FU Orionis, which is thought to be in these episodes. Now, one of these has been recently. Okay? When, when uh, looking at this high temperature needed to explain the UV flux, they say, okay, okay, the accreted matter is hot. And the Baraf Sabri assumption was that the accreted matter was cool. It was only 5,000 Kelvin. But in reality, at least for this star, it seems to be on the order of 100,000 Kelvin. And so one can ask, is that important? And it may be important. But I think the major conclusion of Chabir, Barat Chabir, that the cool um, accreting matter is important to get their results. That is probably wrong. Preliminary conclusion. So the surface composition is affected by dust cleansing. It's possibly primordial in the sense that it was there already when this cluster with a star that formed. But it may be due to late infalling depleted protoplanetary gas disk. Or possibly a short lived such disk and an already early shallow convection zone, probably due to episodic accretion. And the key, very preliminary from this, is that the key thing is, seems to be, the episodic character. The violent episodes when lots of stuff is added and the star shines with a, or at least interior, uh, the energy release due to deuterium burning in the star is on the order of 700 solar luminosities. So that happens, say, every, every thousand year or so and you can build up a star by doing this. So all these dead planets that were formed early on maybe helped the sun to get these characteristics. But this is still, as you see, speculation. I'm very open to suggestions. Um, it's rather tough uh, at the moment to, to be sure about any of this, but I think there are promising stuff uh, and uh, promising things one can do. So more things, study M67 stars, more complementary hosts. That's the thing I haven't talked about now, but it's of course interesting to relate these abundance characteristics to whether the star has plants. Uh, uh, extending uh, temperature in the observational studies, more studies of episodic accretion, which I mentioned, and bring also in their lithium and beryllium as important uh, indicators, and seismology also as important indicators. That's all I have. Sorry for taking <laughs> Thanks, Ben, for a very exciting talk. Interesting talk. Uh, question, please.
the elements directly in the gas phase by the same methods. I guess you took a more relation for sure. Do I understand this? Now? So what what is the process uh, cleansing the dust from the I thought solar environment? I thought of the um, cleansing mechanism could be ready to pressure onto the dust grains. Yes. The dust is swept out by can you by use the same mechanism to sweep out the heavy elements directly in the gas waste, like iron the I haven't thought of it. Of course, I mean, they can catch lots of different photons because that spectra are so rich. Yeah. Um, uh, we have to consider that. I have not It's known to happen, after all, for, for early time stars in their atmosphere. I mean, they class using red to pressure onto that. Your entropy curves, uh, if you could show them those again. Uh, they are, of course, uh, flat during most of the early times, mm -hmm. but then later on they develop rather steep slopes, um, yeah. which are unstable. Yeah. Uh, why? Still unstable. But why are they so steep and uh, why you would expect them to be flat just because of the high mass, of course, even in, the, in these parts? So why do they develop such a steep gradient here? This is, this is, this is still not very close to the surface. No. And in surface, you would expect big gradients. It, it goes gradually out, but as you see, um, you know, it's, it's not a gradient outwards; it's a gradient inwards. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but this is uh, the surface here, right? No, no. This is out. Is that? Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah, then it makes sense. Yeah. Oh. So, so, so surface yeah. is actually here. Yeah, yeah. And you see the. In, in the first case, oh, where yeah. you have a fully yeah. convective star to begin with, you have this enormous... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's all stable, then, of course, yeah. And, right? Yes. In the, in the uh, Ch Charlie and Marat uh, results, you show the lifting depletion rate mm -hmm. function of the, uh, uh, of the core, starting core. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a time. It's a really huge difference. Oh yes, I mean you, you can say from this that if this survives a uh, more detailed observation, we rule out that possibility at least. Yeah, I mean, shouldn't you be able to see this in very easy in yeah, observation? Yeah, yeah. But the problem I have is that I don't fully and I don't think they fully understand how the various parameters come in and play a role for for that diagram compared with other diagrams. So it's not clear how necessary these results are. You should remember that the models have a rather huge set of parameters because you have to specify the full accretion history and that's lots of peaks and the question is, and I tried, I should have made that point clear, it matters how densely they come and it matters how hard, how high they are. These time scales are, are sensitive to that. And then you have M squared dependence in the Kelvin Helmholtz time so, so you can set the parameters in different ways and I don't know how the setting of these parameters affect these different results. And this is also in a way expressed in this Hosokawa paper. They are very frustrated because they can't reproduce the main outcome, one main outcome of the Barash Fabri, and namely that the location here <coughs> and end location is very dependent on the accretion history. They don't get that. So we have to, I have to, to, to do this systematically before you can be sure about how, how certain such predictions as lithium abundance are. But it looks as if lithium is very important in setting constraints here. Mm. You talk about these 15 generations of planets. What, what, what is that about? Isn't that strange? I think they were 19 actually, but I'm, <laughs> not, sure. I don't, I'm, I'm not quite sure concerning the figure. Yes. Um, so what they sent, I, I can show you the paper. I don't have a reference to it, but I can find it. Um, they find sets of instabilities, these spiral instabilities. Yeah, okay. And it will all happen in a very short time scale. Oh, yes. Sequence. Oh, yes. Because, of course, the Earth is still essentially the age of the oh. sun, right? There's no doubt about that. That's true. But they, you know, they t certainly talked about only a few revolutions. 
yes. a few years. Yeah. Uh, but but um, right. the, the point they make is that they are generations in the sense that you, you create them in there's a number of planets or clumps formed and then most of them are swallowed, some are thrown out, then a new one is coming, etc. So you can see uh-huh. kind of rhythmic pattern. Proposal, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? I was thinking about the things that Mahalma Hill was trying to get, but I guess we even have a little bit of bombardment early on, more frequent like that, because we have to build this up to get longer than Mahalma Hill on timescales, also then the crew's longer, longer timescales. Yes. So you have to have more bombardment early on than any cap. Exactly. So, so, I mean, there's a smell here, which I I don't like, and that's the smell of fine tuning. You start thinking, okay, probably we can make the sun here, but, <laughs> but we have to really uh, choose these parameters uh, the best way. Mm. Uh, so, so I think that is um, one of the basic things I would like to do is to map up the parameter space and see if it is really a very narrow one. Um, at the do you make uh, you using this model to explain, okay, um, the, the solar twins are maybe look now very similar in, in size of mass, but they was not similar uh, in the earlier stage? What yes. is your plan? That's, yeah. I mean, but, yeah. but you said, I think, I don't know in this talk, but before the solar twins, you observed that they are very similar, mm-hmm. but only the sun is the one who's out, and the other one in the cluster. So why are they always they are similar and just the sun out? I mean, it's also yeah. Uh, of course, I mean our, our statistics is not too yeah. well. It, it may be that the sun is is uh, one out of ten or twenty or so. Mm-hmm. Um, so. So we don't know how, how exotic it is. Um, but uh, one. I don't like entropic arguments if you don't have to use them, but mm-hmm. one of them could be that uh, these terrestrial planets don't survive in most systems. Yeah. And then you can ask, uh, <laughs> why does the sun happen? And we have a natural, <laughs> natural explanation for it. I mean, that's why we could be wrong. Yeah. But uh, it's not my favorite argument. It looked uh, tremendously close, really, and the, the difference between the two spectra. I mean, very close. Oh, yes. yes. uh, the next best star, how much worse is that already? It's not, it's not my very, very, very much worse. Not so much worse, yeah. So I, I, if uh, the majority of the twins are here, oh. there are a few here, and then this MC7 within the errors, because the errors are still greater, uh-huh. uh, is there and the sun is there. Yes. Uh, I, uh, I think there's good hope that it, you can find one or two stars in the southern neighborhood yeah. that are as good as MC7. But then there's another issue, of course, that if now M67 has this earmark, it's a temptation to try to find these other 28,000 stars that have left <laughs> yeah, <exactly. have> it. <laughs> <together. laughs> Maybe you can find a stream of them somewhere. Ah, exactly, yes, yes. Good one. What are the chances of finding planets that are only stream? Um, uh, that's, uh, and since <coughs> these twins of ours have been, have been uh, now uh, monitored by several groups since we started discussing them. So they are being followed closely. It takes, say, five years or ten years before you can be sure about typical giant plants. And the uh, terrestrial plants are difficult to see. Um, uh, concerning this twin in M67, it would be wonderful to have an instrument like Kepler sitting on M67. <laughs> it's a very good project. Um, uh, but it's very hard to really trace the planet of uh, terrestrial character for such a thing. So it's a major challenge to still. Um, I, should, I didn't mention Kepler before. Kepler is furnishing us with a sample of terrestrial like planets for some of the type stars. So doing a deep, and these are 12th magnitude, 11. So doing detailed spectroscopy of those is quite possible. So I guess we will actually know much more about this possible connection between spectrum auditors on one hand and terrestrial plants on the other hand within a few years. At the Origins Conference last July, I, I heard that the late heavy bombardment might not actually be real. Yes. 
it's disputed. Yes. I've seen that too. So, for that, what do you, what do you think? Yes. I, I, I'm not an expert on, on uh, that one. And uh, of course, the very terminology for it makes it suspicious in a sense. Um, I uh, still, I mean, the question has been raised. Uh, if, if the sun really was born in such a rich cluster, would the solar system have uh, existed? And that's, I think, it was. It, it's interesting to ask yourself what the solar environment was early on. And if you can, since not many people think that at least half of all stars have been born in rich clusters, mm -hmm. it's interesting to see if mm -hmm. it could be true. Mm -hmm. Right, so if there's no further questions, then let's think. Thank you again. <laughs> there will be, of course, more astrobiology uh, on this Friday yes. at um, the geophysics house. See the announcement for that. Okay. So. <laughs>